Life after death. Bruce Grayson. After. What near-death experiences can tell us about life, death, and what comes after? I dedicate this book to those who, having come face to face with death, have graciously shared with me the most personal and profound of experiences. A journey into the unknown. Fifty years ago I had the opportunity to speak with a woman who had just attempted suicide. What I heard from her made me question my knowledge of the human brain, consciousness, and who we really are. I was just bringing a fork of spaghetti to my mouth when suddenly my pager beeped loudly on my belt. I was so engrossed in reading the psychiatric emergency manual I'd placed between the tray and the napkin holder that I flinched at the sudden sound and dropped the fork. It clinked and fell into the plate, splattering tomato sauce on the open pages, and when I leaned over to turn off my pager, I found a red stain on my tie as well. Cursing to myself, I tried to wipe it off with a damp napkin, but it only faded a little and grew in size. I didn't want to waste time walking across the parking lot to the resident's office to change so I just grabbed a white robe from the back of my chair buttoned up so that the stain on my tie wouldn't be visible, and hurried to the ward. I began by reading the admissions report compiled by the nurse. Holly, a first-year university student. She arrived accompanied by her roommate, who was now waiting for me in the relative's room. The nurse's and intern's notes indicated that, although the patient was not awake, her condition was stable and she was under observation and exam room for the presence of an assistant was the usual precaution for mental patients. When I entered, Holly was lying on a gurney, dressed in a hospital gown, with a catheter in her vein, wires from electrodes on her chest stretched to a portable BCG machine next to her bed. Her red hair spread over the pillow, framing a pale face with angular features, a thin nose and lips. Her eyes were closed. She did not move when I entered. On the shelf under the gurney I noticed a bag of her clothes. I lightly touched Holly's arm and called her name, but she didn't respond. Then I turned to the assistant, an older African-American man who was reading a magazine in the corner of the exam room. I asked if he had noticed Holly talking or opening her eyes. He shook his head, unconscious all the time. I leaned over to the patient and examined her. Her breathing was slow but steady, and there was no smell of alcohol. It looked like she was asleep after an overdose of some kind of medication. Her pulse was normal, but there were pauses every few seconds. I took her hands and moved them, checking for mobility and hoping to get a hint of what exactly she might have taken. Her hands were relaxed, moving freely, but Holly was not awake. I thanked the assistant and headed for the family room, which was at the far end of the hallway. Unlike the exam room, it had comfortable chairs, a couch, a coffee machine, and a table with paper cups, sugar, and cream. When I walked in, Holly's roommate, Susan, was pacing back and forth across the room. She was a tall girl of athletic build, with brown hair gathered in a ponytail at the back of her head. I introduced myself and invited her to sit down. She glanced around the room and sat down on the edge of the sofa, still fiddling with the ring on her index finger. I pulled the chair closer to her. There were no windows or air conditioning in the room, and the evening was hot, as usual in Virginia in late summer. I felt myself starting to sweat, so I pulled up the floor fan and unbuttoned my robe. Finally I turned to the girl, Susan, you did the right thing in calling an ambulance for Holly. Can you tell me what happened tonight? I came home late from class and found Holly unconscious on the bed. I called out for her and shook her, but I couldn't get her to wake up. So I called the dorm superintendent and she called the emergency room and I followed them in my car. I still assumed Holly's condition was caused by an overdose of some medication, so I asked, do you know what medication she might have taken? Susan shook her head, I didn't see any vials. But I wasn't looking for any, do you know, if Holly was on any medications all the time? Yes, she was taking antidepressants that she was prescribed at the university clinic. Do you have any other medications 
that she might have taken in your dorm? I have seizure pills in the bathroom cabinet, but I don't know if she took anything from there. Tell me, could Holly have been drinking or taking drugs? Susan shook her head again, I haven't noticed anything like that about her. Did she have any health problems? I don't think so, although I don't know her that well. We only met a month ago, when we moved into the dorms. But you said she was seeing a clinic because she was suffering from depression. Maybe she was severely depressed or more anxious than usual, or had she been acting strangely lately? The girl shrugged her shoulders, I didn't notice anything suspicious. But we weren't that close, I understand. But do you happen to know of anything that might have caused Holly a lot of stress recently? As far as I know, she was doing well academically. Though, of course, it's hard for all freshmen to adjust, this being our first time living away from home, Susan paused in indecision, then continued, I think she was having trouble with her boyfriend. She hesitated again. I think he was making Holly do something she didn't want to do. Forced. Susan shrugged again, I don't know exactly, I just had that feeling. I waited for her to continue, but she was silent. Then I said, you've been very helpful to me Susan. Do you think there's anything else we need to know? Susan made an indefinite motion again. I waited for her to tell me something else, but the girl was silent. It seemed to me that she was trembling a little. How do you feel after all this? I asked, lightly touching her shoulder. I'm fine, she answered a little too hastily. I have to get back to the hostel. I have a paper to write. I nodded. Thank you for bringing Holly. And for waiting for me to tell me everything. Of course, you can go home and do your term paper. If you want you can visit Holly in the morning. If we need anything else, we'll call you. Susan nodded and got up. I walked her to the door, shook her hand, and glanced again at the stain on my tie. Saying goodbye, I buttoned my robe again, so that none of my colleagues would notice it. After that I went back to the exam room to check on Holly. But she was still unconscious, and the assistant confirmed that the patient hadn't even moved since I left. So there was nothing I could do today. I talked to the intern watching Holly and found out that she was going to be transferred to the ICU for cardiac arrhythmia monitoring. So I called my supervisor in the psychiatry department. He agreed that there was nothing else for me to do at that point, but advised me to make sure I had everything written down and to stop by Holly's house first thing tomorrow and talk to her. At 8 o'clock in the morning, during rounds, I would have to report on her condition to the other psychiatrists. As I crossed the parking lot to the residence room I congratulated myself on not embarrassing myself and on my patient being transferred to the ICU, which was lucky because it was the intern who would have to do the history and make the appointments that night, not me. The next morning, after a good night's sleep and a change of clothes, I walked briskly into the ICU and glanced around the shelf at the nurse's station for Holly's chart. One of the nurses was just writing in it. She looked at me and asked, are you from the psychiatric ward? I nodded, I'm Drive. Grayson. It wasn't hard to guess that I was a psychotherapist, I was the only one in the ICU who wore a white robe right over his street clothes, not over his green uniform. Holly's awake, you can talk to her, but she's still sleepy, the nurse said. Her condition was stable overnight, except for a few WES1. I knew that such episodic arrhythmia might not have meant anything, but there remained the possibility that it was caused by some medication Holly had taken the previous night. Thanks, I replied. I'll talk to her for a bit now, and in about an hour she'll have to answer questions from the concilium doctors. Do you think she'll be able to be transferred to the psychiatric ward today in this condition? I think so, the nurse replied, rolling her eyes. The emergency room is full of patients waiting for a bed to become available. I walked over to the room and knocked on the open door jam. Now, in addition to the catheter in her vein, Holly had a tube in her nose, and the EKG readings were displayed on the monitor above her bed. As I entered, 
I pulled the curtain covering the perimeter of the bed behind me and called Holly's name softly. She opened one eye and nodded. Holly, I'm Drive. Grayson. I'm from the psychiatric ward. The girl closed her eye and nodded again. After a few seconds, she barely muttered, I know who you are. I saw you last night, I remember. I froze, going over in my head the circumstances of our meeting last night. Then I said, when the ambulance brought you in, I thought you were asleep. I didn't know you saw me. Without opening her eyes, Holly whispered, not in the room. I saw you talking to Susan, sitting on the couch. I was completely confused. There was no way Holly could have seen me talking to her roommate at the far end of the hall. Maybe she had been in the emergency room before. Maybe she'd guessed I was talking to Susan. Did someone on the staff tell you that I talked to Susan? I suggested. No, Holly answered, this time quite clearly. I saw you. I was quiet, not knowing how to continue the conversation. I was supposed to ask questions and use them to find out what had happened in Holly's life and whether she'd tried to hurt herself. But instead I remained silent, unsure of what to do next. It occurred to me that she was just fooling me, a newly minted intern, trying to knock me out. If so, she was good at it. At that moment Holly, as if sensing my confusion, opened both eyes and looked directly at me for the first time. You were wearing a striped tie, and there was a red stain on it, she said confidently. Doubting if I'd heard correctly, I slowly leaned toward her, and, barely able to utter anything, asked again, what? You were wearing a striped tie, and there was a red stain on it, Holly repeated, without looking away. Then she recounted to me my entire dialogue with Susan, all my questions and her answers, and even the way Susan walked around the room, and the way I moved the fan toward me exactly as it had happened. I felt myself get goosebumps, and the hairs on the back of my neck stood on end. There was no way she could have known any of this. Yes, she could have guessed what questions I was going to ask Susan, but how would she know the details? Had someone already stopped by this morning and told her everything I'd written in the report? But there was no one else in the room when I talked to Susan. No one who could know so exactly what we were saying or doing. And no one in the whole ward, except Susan, had seen that stain on the tie last night. The fact that Holly knew that I was talking to her roommate, much less what I was talking to her about and about the stain on my tie, was completely impossible. And yet she knew. As soon as I concentrated on telling her about it, my mind started to get confused. I couldn't deny that Holly knew all the details of my conversation with Susan. She knew everything, that was a fact. But how could she know? That was something I couldn't understand. She's either just guessing randomly, or it's some kind of trick, I convinced myself. Holly whispered, not in the room. I saw you talking to Susan, sitting on the couch. I was completely confused. But how inexplicably could such a stunt have been pulled? Holly had just woken up from an overdose. She hadn't seen her roommate since yesterday. Maybe the girls had conspired before Holly took the pills and planned what Susan was going to tell me. But they didn't conspire to have me drip spaghetti sauce on my tie. Besides, Susan looked so anxious when she talked to me in the emergency room, and Holly was still lethargic and lethargic. None of this sounded like a prank in any way. I had a lot of questions, but no answers, no time to think about them properly. And there was no one to turn to. This all happened many years before the term near-death experiences was first heard in the English-speaking world. I was dumbfounded by this totally inexplicable occurrence, and all I could do was push my questions somewhere in the back of my mind until better times. Holly was asleep again and the sound of her ragged breathing brought me back to the present. It wasn't my confusion that mattered today. My job was to help Holly deal with her emotions, cope with her problems, and regain her will to live. I needed to focus on figuring out the circumstances in her life that caused her stress and assessing her suicidal tendencies before the other doctors got here for a meeting. I touched the patient's arm again 
and called her name. She opened one eye. I tried to continue my questioning. Holly, can you please tell me what happened to you, what caused the overdose? I was able to find out that she had taken a large dose of amitriptyline, a drug that causes dangerous heart rhythm disturbances. Holly also admitted that she had already experienced an overdose in high school. Her words corroborated everything Susan had said and clarified some of the details. She had struggled to cope with the social pressures of university, struggled to get along with her classmates. She even wanted to drop out, go home, and enrolled in a local technical school, but her parents insisted that she be patient. Soon I noticed that Holly was falling asleep again. I thanked her for the conversation and warned her that a few more doctors would be coming to see her in about an hour. The girl nodded and closed her eyes. Then I informed the university clinic that Holly had been admitted and requested a psychiatrist's statement of her treatment. I then added to the chart a short note about what I had heard from Susan the previous evening and my few observations of the patient's emotional state and thought processes from this morning. However, I did not tell the board everything. I deliberately failed to mention that Holly claimed to have seen and heard me while she slept in the other room. At that moment I decided not to tell any of my colleagues about it until I found some reasonable explanation. At best, people would think I was out of my mind and acting unprofessionally. At worst, they might think I was crazy and making it all up. Clearly, I told myself Holly couldn't have seen or heard what was going on in the relative's room while she was sleeping in the room at the other end of the emergency room. So she must have found out about it some other way. I just couldn't figure out what that way was. The nurses in the ICU didn't know about my conversation with Susan in the emergency room, and no one who had been on duty in the emergency room that night could have known the details Holly had recounted. But, as a young, inexperienced doctor, I could only hide this inexplicable incident deeper in my memory, comforted by vague plans to return to it sometime in the future. Even to my wife, Jenny, I said nothing. The whole thing was too strange. I was embarrassed to tell anyone about what had happened and that I had taken it seriously. And it was clear that if I told anyone, it would make it a lot harder to keep it a secret and I would have to deal with the situation one way or another. I was convinced that there was a logical explanation for how Holly had found out and I thought I should find it myself. And if I couldn't, I had to admit that a part of Holly, with the power to think, hear, see, and remember, had somehow left her body and followed me to the relative's room, where, without eyes or ears, she could nevertheless observe my conversation with Susan. But such an explanation made no sense to me. I didn't even quite understand what leaving my body meant. I was sure that my body was me. And at that point in my life I couldn't even allow myself to think about such things. I had no right to investigate, to ask Susan if she had noticed the stain on my tight, and if so, whether she had told anyone about it. Or to question the nurses who worked in the emergency room that night. Or, even more so, to find out who in the dining room might have seen me drop the fork and then tell Holly about it would be completely unbelievable. I didn't feel like investigating. At that point I would have preferred to just forget about the incident. But I kept coming back to it for the next half century trying to figure out how Holly knew about the saw stain. Neither my life experience nor my scientific training could help me deal with such a serious blow to my worldview at the time. My medical research had received numerous awards, and I had been appointed a permanent distinguished fellow of the American Psychiatric Association. All these years, however, I had been haunted by the doubts about the brain and the mind, that Holly had planted when she said she had seen a stain on my necktie. As a skeptic, I was used to relying on facts, and this prevented me from simply turning a blind eye to an incident of this kind a case that seemed impossible. I had to find a scientific explanation. Thus began my journey. In 1976, when I was director of the psychiatric emergency department at the University of Virginia, Raymond Moody came to me for an internship. 
It was at that time that his book Life After Life, exploring the phenomenon, experiencing the death of the body, suddenly became a bestseller. It was in it that the term near-death experiences, abbreviated ND, first sounded in English. Readers literally flooded him with letters sharing similar experiences from their lives. Raymond didn't have time to answer them, so he asked me, his supervisor, to help him. And I was astonished to find that Holly, with her story, that had once so shocked me, was not alone. Raymond had also met patients who claimed to remember leaving their bodies and observing events occurring elsewhere while they were dying. This discovery led me to think about studying near-death experiences from the perspective of evidence-based medicine. Perhaps if I had not met Raymond personally and read his groundbreaking book, I never would have attempted to unravel that stain case. However, I soon found out that near-death experiences are a well-known phenomenon. It is repeatedly mentioned in ancient Greek and Roman literature, recognized by all major religions, mentioned in the folklore of indigenous communities around the world, and present in the medical literature of the 19th and early 20th centuries. Seven I teamed up with colleagues who also happened to encounter this phenomenon to establish the International Association for the Study of Near-Death Experiences, an organization dedicated to facilitating research in this field. Over the years I have become convinced that near-death experiences, whatever their true cause, are real and have a very profound impact, becoming a source of insight and spiritual growth. For people who have experienced such a state, they have tremendous significance and fundamentally changed their lives. I believe that they are also important to scientists, as they can be an important key to understanding the principles of the brain and consciousness. And I believe that such experiences matter to all of us, because they tell us about life and death, about what it means to die, and what it means to live. To be continued. Sign up to the channel.